Welcome to Early Spring Emergers. My name is Jennifer White with the Portage Park District and I get awfully excited about the amphibians that we start to see and hear more often than not in the parks and in Northeast Ohio every spring. To me, it's uh, just like some of the spring ephemeral wildflowers popping up when I start to hear some of those uh, sounds being made by our early amphibians. It just gives you hope that spring really is right around the corner. And if you're listening to this live, if you're watching live with us tonight, then you know that we've had a 50 plus degree day today. And so that means some of these amphibians may, uh, you may even get to hear them this evening or tomorrow evening. So definitely keep your, keep an ear outside just after dusk and you may get to uh, just, you may get to hear some of them. So that's really exciting stuff. So what we're going to do tonight is go through, um, in terms of salamanders, right on the screen in front of you, you have redback salamanders. We actually won't start seeing these. Um, they don't use uh, vernal pool systems, um, but I love this picture that one of our former staff members took um, on one of our park properties, and these guys are really common in Portage County, and we will be seeing them later. They'll be laying their eggs and breeding later in the season. So we're going to go through some of the some of the animals that we're likely to see early on in the season. And with some of our frogs, I also included a few that are gonna be late spring when they start to call, but it's a, I think it's a really good exercise to uh, familiarize yourself with the different calls. So that's our primary goal tonight is to introduce you to some of these critters and learn what they sound like because most of them you will not actually be able to see, but you will be able to identify them by ear. So uh, come along for the journey with me. Class amphibia, at least in Ohio, that means salamanders, frogs, and toads. Worldwide, there's some other uh, groups that are in this class. But in Ohio, we have salamanders, frogs, and toads. Um, and I put this picture of the toad up here, the American toad, because you're going to see later in the slides a picture with a completely different color variation. They are the same exact species. And these amphibians, um, a couple things that make amphibians as a group um, special. One is they uh, don't drink water, they absorb, they get their water intake through their skin. But that also means that they are highly sensitive to any environmental pollutants um, and can be a bit of a canary in the coal mine for uh, air pollution and water pollution. Um, in fact, worldwide, we're seeing the greatest loss in species diversity in the amphibian group. Um, while some of that is, um, is due to pollutants, the majority of that is really due to loss of habitat. Um, and habitat, I can't say it enough for, well, it's really for anything, but particularly with amphibians, um, habitat matters. Um, so the name amphibian comes from the Greek amphi, which uh, is for dual and bio, just for life. And they really do kind of have a dual life. They spend part of their life cycle, all amphibians spend part of their life cycle in the water. Um, they require water as a portion of their life cycle. And then part of their life is spent on land. And that varies, that ratio and that timing varies from species to species, but you're all, all amphibians are gonna have a little bit of both, a little water and a little land as part of their life cycle. So we will find a lot of these especially the frogs, frog and toad group, a lot of them that rely on larger bodies of water or small ponds of standing water. We have some that uh, rely on uh, streamside environments and creeks, but the ones that are particularly vulnerable and are also particularly fascinating in their, in their adaptations are the amphibians that rely on vernal pools for their reproduction. So I'm going to play a quick video here that I took last March at Dick's Park. We've got a really nice, um, in fact, if you go along the farm trail and up to the uh, Fox Trail and the Trillium Trail, you can see a really nice vernal pool uh, system that's there. It's a series of vernal pools that are connected in the spring, and then as the season progresses, they dry up. So a vernal pool um, is a very specific and special kind of wetland that is usually only full of water in the spring and then they dry up. And in fact, some vernal pools, you will barely even see evidence of them come July or August. But those vernal pools are particularly 
critical, not just important, but critical for amphibian reproduction. So there are some salamanders and some frogs that rely solely on vernal pools to be able to breed, lay their eggs, and continue their life cycle. So I'm going to play this video and you'll hear a couple of these voices again as we move on, but this is just a very early March recording. All right. Well, some of you may know who some of those, there's at least two that you can hear on that, that recording, and we're going to meet them in just a moment. I want to start with salamanders because we just have a few salamanders in Northeast Ohio that utilize vernal pools in early spring. Um, we have a great diversity of salamanders. In fact, um, I could do an entire program just on salamanders. Um, but many of our salamanders don't actually start reproducing until later in the spring and in early to midsummer. Uh, also, many of those don't utilize the vernal pool ecosystem as their breeding site. But this little guy, the spotted salamander, certainly does. And I probably shouldn't say little guy because this is a pretty hefty, substantial salamander. Um, the spotted salamander is one of the mole salamanders, which which is one of the two major groups that our Ohio salamanders fall into. And the spotted salamanders spend most of their lives underground, um, like moles. They spend most of their lives underground. However, right around the time uh, that the air starts to warm up, we get our first warm evening with a nice soft rain and the spotted salamanders begin a pretty epic journey um, back to their vernal pools. Now, most spotted salamanders, research has shown, um, do go back to the same vernal pools or the same area of vernal pools um, where they were born. However, that's not conclusive that that happens um, with all of them. So the spotted salamanders will come out of the ground as the air warms up and we've got a nice evening of warm rain and they will travel sometimes great distances to a vernal pool in order to breed with other uh, spotted salamanders and lay their, their eggs. Usually on vegetation, like a lot of times they'll lay a clump on a, a stick. Their uh, egg clumps tend to be about fist size. Uh, so I'll, I'll show you a picture a little bit later on comparing that to a wood frog uh, egg mass, which looks really similar to the untrained eye at first glance. So. The spotted salamanders um, do that epic journey. And we do have spotted salamanders in our parks. Um, there are, we currently are not doing a, uh, an evening program for that. Um, our spotted, because our parks are not um, split up like some of the metro parks are with, with road systems. We don't get that crossing the road um, scenario that happens en masse in some of the summit metro parks and Cleveland metro parks. However, there are some um, programs where you can actually see them. They have salamander ambassadors to help protect them as they head across the road from um, where they've emerged to where they're going to, to lay their eggs. And they'll go to those vernal pools, they'll breed, they'll lay, they'll lay their eggs. Um, it's a mass movement to those vernal pools, often in one night. Um, now, once they've laid their eggs, sometimes they'll be filtering back over the course of um, a longer period of time back to their burrows, but uh, they will go in mass because this is a race to get those eggs laid. Vernal pools don't last long. And so they wanna get their eggs laid as soon as possible so that they can start that, that, uh, that process so that there's enough water in the, the pool to be able to support those egg masses. And it'll usually take about a week for those to, um, to, to hatch and you'll start to see, um, in fact, at a really late stage, uh, egg, salamander egg, you can actually see the little salamander larva in there. It's pretty, pretty impressive. Okay. Um, next up, we have the Jefferson salamander and the smallmouth salamander. I went ahead and put these together. They are also mole salamanders, just like the spotted salamander. Size-wise, the Jefferson salamander 
is really similar to the spotted salamander. So they're um, gonna be anywhere from five to seven inches and they actually look quite similar um, shape wise. Now this one that's pictured is a little bit lighter color. There will be color variations in them. Some of them have a little more blue on the, the sides. Uh, some of them are darker shade in, you know, in shade, uh, but they are, uh, also a mole salamander and will utilize the vernal pools in the same way as the spotted salamanders. I would say that the Jeffersons are um, a little more inconspicuous. You're not going to um, see them as, as easily. And I think in part that's because of the brilliant yellow spots of the spotted salamander. The smallmouth salamander is aptly named because it has a tiny little mouth. It also has a, um, a, <laughs> a different shaped head too from the Jefferson and the spotted salamander. Um, and it's a little less picky about where it uh, where it breeds and lays its eggs, but it too requires vernal pools. Now, most salamanders um, spend the majority um, of their, their, at least their um, juvenile life in the water. And then when they are adults, they take to the land. So the red spotted newt, also some people refer to it as an Eastern newt, the red spotted newt is an exception to that. Um, the red spotted newt is a salamander. However, it spends the majority of its time on land in its juvenile form. And as an adult, it's in an aquatic form. So stay with me here. The adult, which is pictured on the right, the adult will breed and lay its eggs in the water, underwater. Now I've seen them in um, oxbows, uh, you know, near rivers. I've seen them in ponds and lakes. I've seen them in um, in smaller pools of, of water. So the adults will lay their eggs and be living their life in, in the water. Those eggs will hatch and they'll spend um, a few months in the water also, and then they will go through this amazing metamorphosis where they will actually lose their, lose their gills, they will crawl out of the water, they will become a terrestrial um, salamander, as on the left, we call them red Fs, E-F-T, and the red F will live like that for on average about two years. However, there is some research that shows that they uh, can live like that for a longer period of time. And then when it's time to that for them to transition into adulthood, their tail, if you look at the difference between these tails, um, they will change color, they will become like an olive green color, and their tail will transform into more of a paddle shape, and they will have completed their, uh, their transformation to adulthood. And that is um, a really, it's just a unique a unique little critter. Now the red spotted newt looks so conspicuous, right? Like bright, like you can't miss it. What was it thinking? However, sort of like the monarch butterfly, that color indicates to a predator that hmm, something's up there. And in fact, their skin has some toxins in it that um, really isn't uh, desirable for, for most predators. So even though they're bright orange, um, they often get left alone. Now, once you see one, you think, how did I miss that? But for those of you who enjoy birding, one of my favorite birds is the scarlet tanager, which is a bright red bodied bird with black wings, really stunning. And yet I can hear one and have a challenge finding it up in, in a tree. So the, the red spotted newts, the, uh, the Fs are the same way. Sometimes I think, gosh, where is that little guy? I just saw him. <laughs> where is he? And sure enough, um, he, he does a good job of blending, blending in, even with that bright orange. Um, before we get into the frog calls, one other thing I wanted to mention about the salamanders is what do they eat? Um, most of them do eat insects. Um, they will, uh, as adults, because the mole salamanders in particular are living underground, um, they will eat worms and grubs and, and other insects that are underground. Now let's try out some sounds. So what I'm gonna do with our, we're gonna transition into our, our frogs and toads that we would hear in Portage County in Northeast Ohio. And I'm going to start with the earliest ones and then move our way through the season. And so I'll play the sound of the frog or toad and then I'll tell you who it is. 
talk a little bit about that one and then I'll play the sound again so that way hopefully it solidifies in your head okay so this is our first one all right our first one is the wood frog now Wood frogs to me sound like they're barking. <laughs> it, it also is referred to as quacking. Some, some people think it sounds more like little quacking ducks, uh, but it's very distinctive. And this is one of the first frogs that start calling um, in Portage County. So um, they will start calling down in February, it, down in Southern Ohio in February, generally up as far North as we are, we don't start hearing them until early March. However, if you get a really warm, day towards the end of February, you could hear some wood frogs. Now what's interesting about wood frogs, a lot of things are interesting, but one of the things that's interesting about their timing is that they are, well, have a very short period of time where they, they will breed. In fact, it's uh, the shortest of any of our frogs that are uh, reproducing in this area. Uh, it can be as short as less than a week. Um, they will come, they will breed in the vernal pools, they only use vernal pools for their breeding sites. And then just as fast as they arrived, they will be gone. So I encourage you to get out to your local vernal pool. Dix Park is a great spot to hear wood frogs. Um, and you know, take a hike and you'll even hear them before, because of course our parks are open dawn till dusk. You'll even hear them before, um, before dusk. If you go in the evening, take a little walk down the farm lane and uh, that before you get to the Trillium Trail and the Fox Trail, you'll see that uh, vernal pool system on your right on the south side of the trail. And uh, it's an abundant in wood frogs during breeding season. So they have that barking quacking um, and they have the antifreeze superpower. So they're not the only frog that, that does this, but they can survive the freeze and the thaw. So instead of burrowing under the mud um, and taking cover, or going into a burrow during the winter, the wood frogs just hunker down in the leaf litter at the forest floor. And when the temperature drops um, it below freezing, they freeze and they can survive that freeze thaw period. Now, what's so fascinating to me, they have these nucleating proteins that are in their blood and that causes their, the water in their blood to freeze first. While that's happening, their liver produces an insane amount of glucose, which fills up the cells. And of course, just like an antifreeze that we would put in our car, that glucose keeps them from freezing solid. So it sort of props up the cell wall and they can survive like that just with really gooey insides during the, uh, during the frozen periods. As soon as it gets warm enough to defrost them, slowly they'll defrost, their heart will start beating, they'll get their fluids going and they will be ready to go and uh, ready to breed in the spring. So evenings like this where it is uh, pretty warm, you get a day or two of this uh, consecutively and you're likely to start hearing wood frogs. The picture down at the bottom right I added just to show you uh, a scale and difference between the spotted salamander eggs and the clumps, a clump of wood frog eggs. So the wood frog eggs are on the right, the spotted salamander eggs are on the left. Wood frogs do not, on purpose anyway, lay their um, egg clusters um, on a branch or in vegetation in the water. They just you know, lay, lay them where they are. Um, the spotted salamanders and most salamanders really that uh, will lay their eggs will lay it on purposefully on vegetation like a stick um, or leaves. Oh, let's do one more with the wood frog just so you can remember what that sounds like. Okay. So that was the that was the wood frog. Remember that barking, quacking noise. That's the wood frog. All right. Next up. Okay. So who is that? Next up, we have the western chorus frog. 
This is another neck and neck with our, our wood frog for emergence. Um, they will usually come out in early March here in Portage County in February uh, statewide, and they will continue to call through the early spring. Now the Western Chorus Frog sounds to me like when you're rocking with a creaky rocking chair pretty fast. That's the sound that, uh, that comes to mind for me. They can be identified if you happen to be able to observe one they have three dark stripes down their back. So um, their head, if you look, looks similar to a wood frog and that it has this dark mark, but you can see it extends down on their side. And then they have three stripes, dark stripes on their backs. So that's uh, an identifying characteristic. Let me go ahead and play that again, the Western Chorus Frog, you get that creaky rocker. All right. Uh, next up here is one of my favorites. Oh. Hopefully one of my favorites. Uh, now this call, this recording is going to start off with one individual and then it, you're going to hear more individuals. All right, I bet we have some good guesses for this one. Um, this is the spring peeper and they have that characteristic peep call that they make. And once they get going, a large group of them can be deafening. It's kind of like hearing the periodical cicadas. I mean, they can be really, really loud if you have a lot of spring peepers that are calling at one time. And they also start, they've got that freeze thaw capability. And so they start cooling or they start calling as soon as it's warm enough for them to defrost. And one difference between the spring peeper and the wood frog in their calling techniques is the wood frogs will call from the water. The spring peepers, on the other hand, prefer to crawl up vegetation and call from the vegetation. Um, now, spring peepers are tiny little frogs. They're only about an inch long and uh, like the size of a quarter sometimes. I mean, they are very, very small. They also have um, highly variable colors. Um, they, this one pictured is kind of an orangish or a beigeish color. I've seen them brown. I've seen them almost red. Um, and all the shades in between. So they really can vary in their, their coloration. But one thing that doesn't vary is the X on its back. So if you look here, it's very faint on this particular spring peeper. However, some of them, it will be super definite, but it will always be there, the X on its back um, for that, that spring peeper. Uh, these are a fun frog to um, listen for and then try and find. Um, obviously, if you're at a park, stay on the trail, but you can usually um, you know find a spot uh, to, to listen for them. Um, if you are at home in your backyard and you hear them calling, uh, if you start to walk towards that call, they will stop. But remember, the need is real to find a mate this time of year. So if you just take a few steps and stand still, they will start calling again and then go in the direction of the sound. They'll stop wait for them to start and you just can kind of hone in on where that spring peeper is. And so if you have your flashlight with you then, when you think you're there and it starts calling, you can put the flashlight on it and actually see their vocal sacs um, expand and contract and see them call and you can see how they perch themselves on the stems of plants. Um, really a fun little frog. And once you see them, you think, how does that level of noise come out of that little amphibian? So a really fun, uh, fun frog to, that we have uh, to enjoy in our area. Again, this is one that on these warmer evenings, after a nice warm day, it's likely that you'll start to hear the spring peepers. And because they're so loud um, and they have a long period of time where they'll, they'll be breeding, it's, it's a pretty common one for people to, to ID. Do the peeper real quick. All 
Okay. Here's our next one. All right, this is the northern leopard frog. They have that low grunting that they give. Some people uh, liken it to the sound of rubbing your finger over a balloon surface. Um, to me, it just sounds like they're grunting. They have that low guttural grunt. Um, they are calling beginning in March. Um, here in Portage County, we're not gonna hear, start to hear them until a little bit later into this month, um, but they'll call through the month of May. Uh, and they're aptly named because they have those leopard-like spots on their backs. Um, something I'm gonna point out with the Northern Leopard Frog that'll be relevant um, when we meet another frog later on is that leopard frogs are often bright green with those dark spots um, or some shade of green. Like the one pictured here definitely has some brown in it, um, but you can really see that green background uh, to those brown spots. A really striking frog and one that um, I actually don't see often, but definitely here. So uh, we'll play that again for you. All right, there's our northern leopard, leopard frog. Moving right along here. This is another, this is a fun one. And a really common one. I think this is one that uh, a lot of people hear and they don't realize what is creating this sound. Okay, this is the American toad. Now, you probably heard a couple little peepers in the background there. The key to the American toad call is that it's a long trill. So 20 to 30 seconds. And so if you can imagine more than one American toad calling at the same time in the spring, then that sound is going to just carry for uh, minutes. <laughs> so they have a really long trill, long sustained trill to their, their mating call. And they'll start calling in late March, again, through May. In June is when we start to see all the tiny little baby toads um, bouncing around the, the yards. Their eggs are laid in the water, even though they spend most of their life um, on land, they do lay their eggs in the water. And they're very easy to identify as toad eggs in the water because they lay their eggs in long strings. So instead of in those clumps of eggs or single eggs, they lay them in a long string of eggs. So that's an easy way to identify the toad eggs. So again, here's our trilling toad. All right, so let's move on here. And I want you to think about the coloration on that leopard frog uh, that we just went over and listen to this next one. little peeper at the end. So this is the pickerel frog. Now pickerel frogs to me sound like they're snoring. <laughs> um, however, their snore, if you remember back to the leopard frog um, with all the grunting, um, the leopard frog will do some grunting and then we'll have some shorter bursts of snoring. The pickerel, pickerel frog tends to have these longer bursts of um, snoring. So and, and very, very definite snoring. Late March, early April for us, into, into May. One of the big differences with their color patterns, when you first look at it, you think, ah, Jen, it's spotted just like the leopard frog, but it's not. 
<laughs> it has rectangular spots that are along the along its back as opposed to the rounder ones of the leopard frog. But more importantly, you're not going to see the green on the background of the pickerel frog. So if you do happen to uh, spot one of these, they're usually brown in color or tan in color for their, their background to those um, beautiful spots. And they prefer streams. Um, for they, you'll find them much more commonly, not that they won't nest in ponds, but or standing water, but they prefer that moving water. Now, the pickerel frog, um, this particular one, is, this photograph was taken on Headwaters Trail. So um, they are definitely around and visiting our, our parks. Really pretty one. I'll give you another taste. That snoring. So remember habitat, 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 right? Um, you can tell some of these based on which how, what kind of habitat you're close to, um, what it could be. Okay, let's move on to one of my other favorites. This is the gray tree frog. Now, they start to call slightly um, later. They're gonna um, start to call in later in April. And actually they will go through up to July um, with their calling. So it's really interesting with gray tree frogs. They uh, sometimes, especially midsummer, because we're used to being done, you know, we're done with the frog calling after spring, um, which isn't true. We have a few other species here coming up that also will call later into the summer. But the gray tree frog, a lot of folks um, will be sitting out on their porches and I'll get messages from friends saying, what is this? And they'll do the recording. What bird is this? Um, but it's not a bird. It's, it's a tree frog. Now, it is the gray tree frog, but you'll notice the picture, the little guy looks green and that's because they are able to change color based on what they're um, sitting on. So if we put him onto the side of the tree, they're going to change color to like browns and grays, much closer to that gray. Um, when you have them on vegetation, um, or in this case, um, being held in hand, um, they will be uh, more of a, a bright green color. So they're, they're a nice little, nice little color changer, tiny frog. Um, I should have mentioned this earlier, but um, they are a member of the family Hylidae, which uh, one of the characteristics of that family, which includes spring peepers and chorus frogs and the tree frog, is that they have little pads on their uh, on their feet. And so, if you've ever seen a tree frog like up on your siding or you know on the side of a tree, you notice they have those very distinctive suction cup-like pads on the bottoms of their feet, and that is one of the identifying characteristics of members of that family. So the gray, gray tree frog, very common resident here. And again, they have these loud um, trills, unlike the uh, American toad that has the long trills, the gray tree frog has loud, shorter trills. And our next frog, we actually heard in the background of that last recording. And so that's gonna make sense to you in a moment. So here's our next guy or gal. Now this is the most abundant and most common uh, frog in the state and definitely in our area and that is the green frog. So they aren't always bright green, sometimes they're closer to a, a brownish shade, but they have two very pronounced ridges that go down their backs from their eyes down their backs called dorsolateral folds um, and that is uh, 
a, a real easy way to identify the green frog. Their call sounds like you're plucking the strings of a banjo. And they do start calling a little later in the spring and they'll continue calling throughout the summer. So really common. Um, we're gonna talk about this and the next picture shows it a little bit better, but they're, um, uh, you can tell by their ear pads, like how, how, whether it's a male or a female. So um, the females, it's about the same size as their eyes, a little bit smaller. The males, it's, it's much bigger. So let's do the banjo plucking again for the green frog. All right, you heard, I hope you heard those little peepers in the background too. All right, our next, and this is our last one that we're gonna do actually, is right here. really get going. It's our largest frog in this area and that is the bullfrog, the American bullfrog. Um, and they have that deep rum, rum uh, call. Um, you notice here their eardrum is um, visible on the side here. Uh, again, females, the eardrum size is about the size of their eyeball. Um, for the males, it's much larger. So that's one way to tell the difference between the males and females. Um, unlike a lot of our, uh, the, really the rest of our are frogs in Northeast Ohio. The tadpoles usually develop, go through their development within one season. And the bullfrogs are the exception to that. Their tadpoles take um, at least two years to fully mature to adulthood. So uh, if you find really big tadpoles, um, those are usually the second or third year tadpoles of the bullfrogs. Um, bullfrogs eat a, most of our um, frogs will eat smaller insects, um, but bullfrogs will go beyond the insect realm. Uh, there have been uh, studies of bullfrog stomachs that have showed up birds and bats, um, all kinds of things. So basically, if they can get it into their mouth, um, they will consume it, including other frogs. Um, there are some habitats where bullfrogs really do outcompete the other frogs that might be living there just because they predate them. So um, a really, really large um, frog, also rather territorial. So, uh, you know, a bullfrog, a male bullfrog will defend its territory against others um, and they can, they can get pretty large. They're, they also are very long lived. Um, so the lifespan, I read up to 30 years. I've no, I, I think most of them are around 10 years, but still that's, that's, a, that's a lengthy, that's quite the life, uh, lifespan for uh, a little amphibian. Um, so they will start calling in late May, and again, we'll call throughout the, the season, and we'll hear one more time that room, room. That one's pretty unmistakable, right? <laughs> All right, so I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit more about the uh, early spring emergers, how to identify some of those. Please get out there in the next, uh, this evening or tomorrow and listen, because uh, remember that wood frog window with those barking, quacking wood frogs is very, very short. Uh, the rest of our amphibians, you've got a little wiggle room to get out and enjoy them, but the wood frogs in particular are early and short-lived with those calls. I have some resources up on the screen right now. Um, you can take a screenshot or just wait on the, the uh, replay of the video of resources that I really, really like. Um, ODNR's Guide to uh, Ohio Amphibians, it looks like this. And if you would like one of these, I do have a supply of these um, at the park district and I'm happy to pop one in the mail to you. So just reply to uh, the email 
your email confirmation and I'll get one of those out. It not only catalogs all of the, of course it covers the state of Ohio, but it does have range maps in it. Not only catalogs all of the salamanders that are in Ohio, but also all of the, the frog species. And there are some that are never found in Northeast Ohio. So if you're traveling around the state, it's kind of neat to be able to learn about the other species that are, are found in other areas. Frog Watch USA is a great resource. In fact, um, we are looking at starting a, a Frog Watch USA monitoring um, group probably next year for our citizen science program. So if you are interested in participating in something like that and you want to really hone your skills at uh, Amphibian ID, uh, please keep that in mind. And I encourage you to go to our website and sign up to be a volunteer and be sure to include citizen science as one of your um, one of your preferred ways to volunteer. And so you'll get, you'll already be included in that, that group. Um, Amphibia Web is a international resource. So if you wanna really see what's wild and wonderful in the amphibian world, um, there's, that's a great resource. Also on taxonomy, that's a really good resource uh, if you geek out on amphibian taxonomy. Um, if you want a little, get some good resources on wetlands, particularly vernal pools. The last two are, are good resources for that. So let's see, I'm going to stop my screen share here. And at any time, you can certainly give me a, a shoot me a message and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. But let's see, I see we've got a few questions here. Oh, good. How old can they get? Good question. So um, obviously, it depends on species. Uh, we can't paint them all with the same broad brush. Um, but some species of frogs and salamanders will just live a few years and others will live up to a decade. Um, so it, it depends on the species, but they, they are, they do have a pretty long life for, for little critters. Um, yes, Jan, there was, she asked, was there a bullfrog in the distance with the spring peeper call. Um, yes, in fact, in a number of those, when you do the rewatch, um, you will be able to hear in a number of those recordings, um, multiple frogs. And that's typical because um, remember, they're looking for that spot where they can go and lay their eggs. And so it is really common to hear more than one species calling at the same time. Um, particularly once we hit April, because everybody's ramped up about the only people that aren't part of the party are the wood frogs come April. So it's really common to hear more than one species calling at the same time. How do sal okay, to ask, how do salamanders, especially eggs or new hatchlings cope with periods of cold weather that may partially freeze them? Excellent question, Joe. Um, this is really interesting. So uh, the early, uh, really any of the, uh, amphibian egg lay any of their eggs, but this is particularly important for the early ones, we get that freeze thaw. So just like the wood frogs are able to go ahead and um, they're able to freeze and thaw with that antifreeze system, um, there's also adaptations for these vernal pool users for that freeze thaw with their eggs, because what good does it do to thaw and get out there and breed and lay your eggs and then have your eggs freeze and not make it, right? So that gelatinous material that's around the outside of um, each of those eggs, um, just like um, the nucleating proteins in the blood of the frogs that do the freeze thaw, that material um, is designed to freeze before the inside of the egg is. So when it freezes, it basically pools the water out of the egg inside, temporarily desiccating that egg, but keeping it from freezing. So as soon as the uh, weather warms up and that outside area um, defrosts, then the water goes back in and rehydrates the embryo or larva that's inside. So good question. And I appreciate you joining us this evening and supporting the parks and we'll see you soon out on the trail.